One of the worst things about economics education is when people take only one or two classes in economics, hear the conclusions of simple economic models, and then apply that to the real world. Usually, the real world is a lot more complicated than simple economic models present. And if you don't understand those complications, serious damage can occur. And, and I actually think tariffs is, is an example of that. Are tariffs always bad in the real world? Okay, so I just got finished talking about why tariffs are bad. But I was using a very simple model. The correct answer to the question, are tariffs always bad in the real world, is no. Or at least not necessarily. It depends on the situation. So let me give you a real world example. Before 1990, before, because I didn't write this down, before NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which was, let me write, let me write that a little bit better, which was an, an international organization, an uh, international uh, agreement negotiated by the first President Bush, s but supported and then signed by President Bill Clinton between the U.S., Canada, and North America, and it was uh, superseded in, I don't know, maybe 2018, by a tweaked agreement. Um, so before 1990, bef and NAFTA came into, I don't, I didn't look up when it came into force, I think it was like 1993 or 1995. So, but before, let's say, 1990, there were Mexican tariffs against the importation to Mexico of corn grown in the United States. So let's think about, let, let, let's ask the question, uh, was that, was getting, was NAFTA a good idea? In this one very narrow sense, was getting rid of those tariffs a good thing? Well, clearly the corn, the corn tariff was a market imperfection. And eliminating the tariff probably did help Mexican consumers more than it hurt Mexican farmers because of the analysis that we just described. But that wasn't the whole picture. There's another market imperfection. The other market imperfection was water pollution generated by U.S. corn farmers using agrochemicals. So the Mexican farmers that were growing corn. Uh, some of them were big farmers and they used agrochemicals as uh, as well, but, but lots of them were small farmers engaging in organic agriculture because they couldn't afford to buy agrochemicals. They couldn't afford to be anything other than organic farmers. The U.S. farmers were all using agrochemicals and fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, they don't stay on the farm. They rainwater carries them away, uh, or snowmelt carries them away, into waterways. And so the water, water pollution generated by U.S. corn farmers using agrochemicals was another market imperfection. So what you had is a situation not of one market imperfection, but of two. Now let's think about what happens when NAFTA comes in. You eliminate the tariff. Yes, as I said, it probably uh, helped Mexican consumers more than it hurt Mexican farmers, and it certainly helped U.S. corn farmers. But it was a net negative for the environment because you put organic corn farmers, me organic peasant Mexican corn farmers out of business, and you increase the output of U.S. corn farmers who use agrochemicals and generate negative externalities for the environment. So is that a net good or a net bad? You don't know a priori. You can't use the theory that we developed in the other videos to say tariffs are bad. Because, because eliminating the tariff had some positive effects, but it had a negative effect as well. It made things worse on the environment. 
what you need to do in this kind of situation is actually run numbers, do uh, collect data, do econometric studies, using some of the techniques that we're going to be learning in other chapters, in, in, in future chapters. Um, you just have to see where the numbers come out. It's a mistake to just conclude tariffs are bad because of a simple model that you learn in your first economics class. Now, I, I want to talk about tariffs more generally because, as you saw in the early 1990s, there was a bipartisan consensus. Both the Republican and the Democratic Party thought that free trade was a good thing. And the result of that during the 1990s and early 2000s was a large opening up of the economy, allowing China to join the World Trade Organization, huge increases in international trade. This has had very positive effects for China. It's had very positive effects for American consumers. The price of things like clothing is much lower now than it used to be, let's say 30 years ago. But it's had devastating effects for people who work in areas where, in the United States, where the factories are shut down, where deindustrialization has, has occurred. Unfortunately, most of the economic analysis around tariffs has revolved, have, has used the potential Pareto criteria, which is that if, upon elimination of tariffs, you could make everybody better off, then tariffs should be eliminated even if you're not going to make everybody better off. And this is one reason why I really don't like the potential Pareto criterion. Because what, what good is it to adopt a policy like getting rid of tariffs because it could make everybody better off if you're not actually going to make everybody better off? You're adopting something because of a counterfactual hypothetical that's never going to happen? That just seems like a weird way to run a government. And yet, much of the impetus of free trade agreements is exactly the kind of simple diagram that we had in the previous video where uh, that, that shows that, that a tariff is inefficient in this really simple model. So don't get fooled by simple economic models. The, the real world is often more complicated. Let me end with one of the most depressing results in economics. It's called the theory of the second best. What it says is, if there are n market imperfections, so n is a number, like in the in Mexican case there are at least two. One market imperfection was the tariff and one market imperfection was the American uh, corn farmers using agrochemicals and hurting the environment. If there are n market imperfections, eliminating all n of them will improve efficiency. So that's the Adam Smith invisible hand uh, arrow de Brewer result that if you eliminate all market imperfections, then yes, laissez-faire is optimal. And what it actually means is, uh, what Arrow and de Brewer actually mathematically proved is that if you, if, you, if you have an economy that satisfies all their really stringent conditions, which no real economy ever will, then the competitive equilibrium is efficient, which means it's Pareto optimal. So that's what they really proved. Okay, but let me read this. If there are n market imperfections, eliminating all n of them will improve efficiency. Great. But no statement about efficiency change can be made, in general, about eliminating fewer than n of them. So if you have two market imperfections, the tariff and the environmental pollution caused by U.S. corn farmers, if you eliminate both of them, yeah, that's good. But if you eliminate only one, like the tariff, and you leave the other one, like U.S. corn farmers polluting waterways, you don't know whether it's good or bad. Or suppose you have a real-world situation with 10 market imperfections. If you, if you eliminate all 10 of them, yes, things are going to be better. In fact, they're going to be Pareto efficient. But if you have 10 market imperfections and you eliminate one, you could be making things worse, or better, we don't know. 
If you have 10 market imperfections and eliminate two, you could be making things either better or worse. If you have 10 market imperfections and you eliminate three, you could be making things either better or worse. In other words, if you have 10 market imperfections and you eliminate one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine of them, we don't know that that's going to make things better. That make, makes things worse. Only if you eliminate all 10 are we guaranteed in economic theory to make things better. Okay, This is really depressing because, for example, environmental economists study environmental problems. International trade economists study problems with tariffs. If you have a situation like the NAFTA negotiations, it's mostly going to be uh, economists specializing in international economics that are going to be involved. There might not be any environmental economists at the table because you think, well, you're just talking about tariffs. What does that have to do with the environment? But as you can see from this example, maybe eliminating tariffs was a bad idea because it made the environmental problems worse. How are you going to prevent this from happening? The only way to prevent it from happening is from knowing all the market imperfections, all the externalities and other problems like asymmetric information problems and, and, and problems with, uh, uh, with uncertainty and problems with imperfect competition, all the problems that are in, entailed in a real world situation. So you'd need all different kinds of economists looking at it from their own angles and you need to put all those together. But frankly, in the real world, that really doesn't happen. Um, the U.S. State Department has economists who specialize in international trade. They don't have environmental economists. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has economists specializing in environmental economics. They don't have an, uh, international trade economists. So it's really challenging, both in the real world, to, to understand what all the possible imperfections are and then to know what the best policy is. This is hard even in teaching. Um, I mean, I know something. I, I took a, one class, actually, I think it was only one, in international trade when I was a graduate student. And of course, I know environmental economics. So I can put these two things together. But that's just a coincidence. And there are other things that I didn't take courses in. So I probably don't understand what the market imperfections are involved in those areas of economics in, let's say, a field like NAFTA. Um, for instance, how, NAFTA and unemployment. Well, I'm not a labor economist, so I didn't really study that. I'm not a macroeconomist either. So um, we will usually, in this class, be studying simple models, like the one in the previous video, because, after all, this is an introductory class, and you guys, for the most part, aren't econ majors. I will be careful, however, to try to avoid misleading you with simple models. But misleading people with simple economic models is really easy to do. Uh, and this example with tariffs is, is just one example. So please don't conclude from what I showed you that tariffs are always bad. The real world is, unfortunately, more complicated than that. Okay, I think now we're done with chapter six. If I look over, just a minute, let me look at my notes and see. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Uh, there might be one more topic, we'll see. But uh, in any case, I'm going to shut this video off now and see you in the next one.